All right, and now to the actual topic I wanted to talk about, and this is uh, open source uh, data science platforms. Uh, maybe just a quick question, how many of you know Kubeflow, for example? We already asked how many use uh, or know Jupyter, that were some more hands, uh, but basically we're just gonna see uh, what it actually takes to build an entire platform. How many actually try to use TensorFlow on their laptop or somewhere else? Again, some hands. I actually feel uh, TensorFlow, it's very similar to using Minikube. Like using that on my laptop, it's super simple. I download like a binary, I start that up, I download MNIST, and like within half an hour, I actually trained my first neural network. Unfortunately, if I want to do that in production, it's a bit harder. Typically, the first step is using Kubeflow, and we'll see like what that is. That's basically uh, machine learning on Kubernetes. Uh, but in the end, if we further develop that, Kubeflow actually isn't enough it by itself. And so what we typically end up with is building like a full-fledged pipeline uh, where on the left, we typically start with data and streaming. Then we have model engineering where our data scientists actually can get active. We have distributed model training. We need to store and manage the trained models in some way. We actually need to do serving in the end. Uh, we probably want some continuous integration to automate all those steps. Uh, if we want to share like the features our data scientists have developed. So a feature, for example, imagine your Airbnb, a feature is simply like a representation of a user. Uh, so the first data scientist who's just getting that entire data set, this raw data set somewhere stored uh, by Airbnb, the first thing he needs to do is actually clean up the user data and to create some kind of representation which he can use as that's typically like 50 to 60% of a data scientist's workload, it really makes sense to actually share that, and this is why we have a future catalog down here. And similarly with the trained models, we also want to share them, we want to be able to reuse them for later training runs, uh, so-called transfer learning, where we take an existing model and we incrementally learn with like some additional data sets, and uh, so we already see we end up with a lot of components to build uh, such kind of data science uh, pipeline or platform. Um, to start out, uh, those uh, who don't know me yet, uh, I'm the technical lead over at Mesosphere for uh, data science. I've been around Mesosphere for probably four years. Before that, I did a little bit of SAP HANA architecture. Uh, over at SAP, and before that I did my PhD on distributed database systems, Spark, HDFS, and all this kind of stuff. MapReduce was still a big hype back then. Why is machine learning taking off? So why do we actually care right now? It's actually, uh, we turn our data scientists into superheroes right now for a number of reasons. First of all, we have access to large data sets. Uh, and this is especially useful if we want to train something like neural networks where we simply need a large uh, data set to train decent models. Second thing, to train those decent models, we also need a lot of compute resources and also we simply today have quite large clusters available. And the last thing, obviously, also research uh, in ML, in neural networks has really progressed. So we have some really cool architectures uh, where we can do fancy stuff and not everyone has actually to develop neural network architectures from scratch. And uh, by that we can actually, we can have uh, identify self-driving cars. Uh, we can, this is, I find that really cool, it's like Deep Bach, it's actually, it's composing music and it really sounds quite decent uh, the first time I heard that. I was pretty impressed. And so, what is the challenge now? So if I'm the superhero, I really want to do all this cool stuff here, self-driving cars, composing music. So I actually want to spend like all my time sitting here, writing my TensorFlow model, writing a really cool machine learning code. Once I'm done, I'm training my model. As I'm the superhero, obviously that's one take and I have the perfect model. And once I'm done, I'm actually handing over that model to some DevOps engineer and be like, hey, here, deploy that to production, I'm done, and I can tackle the next really cool problem. Unfortunately, reality looks slightly different. Uh, 
Uh, reality kind of looks more like that, where there's a small box here, there's a small black box. So this is the actual time I can spend on writing ML code, whereas like all this stuff around uh, is taking up most of my time uh, being a data scientist. And this is, this is actually not made up. This is a paper by Google. And if you can already see if Google is saying this is the distribution of work, probably that's even going to be worse for people outside of Google. And uh, this is actually uh, why they came up even uh, as well with Kubeflow. So Kubeflow is a simple pipeline. So uh, it includes uh, Jupyter. It includes some distributed model training using uh, TensorFlow and then all the other TensorFlow components such as TensorBoard, uh, TFDebug, and also the model serving inbuilt into uh, TensorFlow. By now, I think I have said like on one of the next slides, it's actually, it's a bit more, uh, but I feel Kubeflow right now, it has become like a loose collection of many tools for data science. So it gets a little bit away from the flow part where it's really like flowing through this pipeline but it's basically a collection of uh, tools for data science right now. So uh, this is kind of their mission statement. They want to make it easy to really deploy machine learning workflows on Kubernetes and makes it simple and portable here. Um, has anyone by any chance seen this paper here? Paper around TensorFlow or TensorFlow Extended, which is basically explaining uh, where they want to go with, it, with that entire TensorFlow ecosystem. So this is already pretty similar to the pipeline we saw earlier. So we have like data transformation, data analytics, uh, inline data validation, and so on and so on, serving here in the end. Um, and this TensorFlow extended, that was the original uh, motivation actually for them to come up with Kubeflow. But as you can see, this by now, it doesn't even mention TensorFlow anymore because it has evolved since then. So as of now, I think they released the 0.3 version over at KubeCon the other week. Uh, we actually not only can run TensorFlow in here, there's also like PyTorch, MXNet, uh, some hyperparameterization optimization on top. But as I said, it has kind of become this like loosely coupled uh, system where anyone is just throwing his or her machine learning uh, tools inside. And the second challenge is this actually works well if you're inside Google Cloud because there are a lot of components missing. You simply get for free by the cloud. And this is, for example, having cloud storage. So if I'm outside of the cloud, I actually need to figure out what's my own storage. But while I'm in Google Cloud, while I'm in Amazon, I simply get S3 and all those other cool storage services. Also, data preparation. I need something like Spark where I can actually do like batch processing of data set and prepare them. And what's also really, really useful is to have a message queue uh, like Kinesis, like Kafka, where I actually get a stream of data and I can hit my machine learning model with that. What can I do if I'm like outside, if I'm in my own data center, or I want to be independent of those specific cloud tools? I can use open source technologies. I can use Spark for data pre-processing. I can use HDFS, I can use Kafka, and I can use all those other tools. But again, this is even adding more to uh, all those different systems I have to maintain. And then if I really build this full-fledged system with monitoring, with CICD, uh, feature catalog, notebook, library, note, uh, model library, I eventually have to end up maintaining all those different sub-projects and actually following all those different sub-projects. It's probably possible, but it's a real burden to your uh, DevOps, uh, data ops team. Um, and that's actually leading to this first challenge, and this is uh, coming to personas. We already talked about our superhero, the data scientist here, but actually in real life he needs a side gig uh, helping him because by himself, this Typically, a data scientist, they come from like a mathematical background. They don't want to manage distributed computations. They don't want to set up a large-scale HDFS, Cassandra, or Kafka cluster uh, because that's not what they are good at and that's probably also what they don't really like too much. Uh, so this is why they need a sidekick. And uh, this is typically nowadays referred to as like a data ops engineer. Uh, 
So this data ops engineer or other companies, they also come like data engineers, machine learning engineers, and they actually, they combine those two skills. They have some understanding of data science, but they don't need to have this deep mathematical background to actually de develop their own models. They simply need to understand uh, some bits and pieces to map that onto infrastructure. And then the second big skill is really like distributed systems engineering. They understand what it takes to have reproducible systems, how to set up Kafka, how to set up Cassandra. And it's kind of like this equivalent of like a DevOps uh, person, but for data science uh, focus. Um, and then if we look at actually the division of labor, uh, it already looks a bit more favorable. So here Green, this is our data scientist. He still has to do like some more parts than writing just ML code, like feature extraction, uh, uh, analyst uh, tools, and also like some model monitoring. But all of a sudden, this is now all really concerned with data or model engineering. And this is really what the data scientist is good at. And all the other parts, uh, they can actually be thrown over to the data engineer, like data collection, verification, process management, monitoring of this entire thing. And then there are also like the normal DevOps persons maintaining the rest of the cluster. So that already like uh, is giving our data scientist a lot more time to focus on his core labor. The other aspect is actually, uh, I feel we need to come up with uh, more standards in this area. Right now, what I see even at like large companies over in Silicon Valley, is this is a very ad hoc process. And I feel software engineering principles, so this is actually the first written paper on a software engineering or software engineering principles. They, it was mentioned once before, but unfortunately there's no paper for that. And uh, so I feel really like this, discipline of software engineering has really moved forward how we develop software. We have things like CACD, we have things like uh, testing patterns, uh, we have requirements engineering, and this is kind of standardized and really made uh, software engineering uh, move forward quite a bit. And uh, I would actually challenge that we need something similar for data science, call it data science engineering principles or what you want but basically that we get together as a community and collect best practices that not everyone is doing everything from scratch in a very ad hoc way. And people like Ian Goodfellow, uh, one of the uh, icons I would say in uh, machine learning research is actually agreeing with that. It's basically we should come up with a set of best practices uh, around ML development here. I would say like the first thing I, for probably like you don't necessarily need to standardize, but you should consider certain things. So for example, if you look at requirements engineering in traditional software engineering, if before starting a machine learning project, we actually go in and first of all think, do I really need machine learning? Uh, do I really need neural networks? Uh, having talked to a lot of large enterprises, uh, I feel often it's a requirement because the CTO has read how cool neural networks are, how cool TensorFlow are, and this is why they actually are doing a project now with TensorFlow. And uh, often this will actually fail to be deployed into practice simply because uh, for, for using uh, neural networks, I need something like decent data sets. Uh, I can only train neural networks if I have a decent amount of data and also decent amount of high quality data. The worse the data is I throw into neural networks, the worse is going to be the output. And so it should actually be the question not do I need that, but can I actually use it given the resources I have, given the data I have here available. The second, and this is probably like the biggest challenge, and this is a challenge coming back to your question, I would probably tackle first, is reproducible builds. What I typically see, uh, people starting out with is this ad hoc process I showed on this first slide, like what the data scientist would like to do. He's building some kind of model up maybe on his laptop. Once he's happy, he's throwing it over to some DevOps engineer and is like, hey, deploy that into production. And then a month later, when actually regulators are coming in and they're asking, oh, why did that model make this decision? And typically they are not even able to rebuild uh, that same model from scratch because they have no clue what was the training function, what was the git char of that uh, current version which was used for that training, what data set was used for that training, uh, 
what parameter was uh, range was used for that training. So this is probably like the biggest challenge I see is to simply be able to go back and reproducibly build a model. And therefore I find like two tools uh, very useful. Like first of all, having like a git commit of like one artifact representing the entire machine learning project and we'll see what ML flow can do there in just a second. And the other is to have like continuous integration, continuous delivery, because it actually forces me to have uh, an artifact from which the CICD system can reproducibly build uh, that artifact, that model. And so MLflow, it's an open source project, uh, mostly dri driven by Databricks, and it consists of several components. And I find here this middle component, and we'll see that in a second, that's actually the coolest in terms of reproducible builds, uh, because it gives me this like one artifact structure uh, which I can simply use and always rebuild uh, the same model on any infrastructure. And the other things which are integrated here is tracking. So it gives me an, a way, you might have seen like TensorBoard, uh, which can keep track of like certain uh, metrics, certain like loss, what is my accuracy of my model right now. And uh, MLflow tracking is basically like a similar version, but it works across like all projects. It works across PyTorch, uh, MXNet, or whatever other machine learning system you want to use. And this is the one I mentioned, like MLflow project, where we can simply define, it's actually, it's a very simple project. It's just a folder structure uh, together with a YAML file. Uh, but uh, using that, I can actually have something uh, MLflow run, and this will reproducibly build my model I have specified in here. If if I keep like all the data references uh, also in a virgin uh, artifact. But this already gives me this one artifact. I can throw over to my CACD pipeline and then the CACD pipeline can actually be ignorant of what tool I've used. Because that's the other big challenge uh, I've been seeing that different data scientists actually like different tools. One data scientist, he likes TensorFlow. Another data scientist, he likes MXNet. And then this poor DevOps person who actually has to deploy that into production later, he actually has to understand all those different frameworks. And this, first of all, gives me a way of uh, making the CICD platform ignorant about whatever framework is being used. And secondly, then MLflow model is the equivalent basically for later on serving that model so that a DevOps uh, engineer, he doesn't have to understand what is being used here, whether that's a TensorFlow model, uh, whether that's uh, a Flask model or something else, uh, he simply uh, has one simple interface to actually run that later on. By using that, we can actually simplify this entire process and also, again, we see how it's being divided by different personas. So the data scientist, he can stay up here, uh, he can deal with data and his model, and once he's done here, currently that's still like a git commit, uh, but this git commit will trigger the CACD pipeline here, and then we have the distributed training, the model testing, model optimizations, and then also the model storage as part of like the continuous integration part. And if I really want to extend it also to uh, CD, I can even include those steps like model serving into the pipeline itself uh, so that that also happens automatically. Um, for all those people who said uh, they haven't seen, because now, now kind of the challenge is like, what is the interface for my data scientist to stay up here? And kind of the standard which is uh, if, if de um, developing there is, I think, Jupyter. And uh, Jupyter, for those who haven't seen it, it's basically it gives me so-called notebooks. And notebooks can have different kernels. So I can, for example, here have my R kernel and I can go in and simply write my R code in here. I can write my Scala code. Apache Tori is basically like a Spark uh, backend. And I as data scientist, this is typically like a web page. So I can simply stay on my web page. Uh, I don't have to set up any environment. And there I can develop my code. And this is what we'll also see later on a bit more in the demo. Uh, next challenge is about uh, data quality. Uh, and data quality is uh, it's also relating to this feature development I mentioned earlier. 
only demo data set. So typically the people who download this MNIST data set and then they build their first model, they underestimate that a large percentage of their time will actually be spent by cleaning the data and preparing the data. So missing or incorrect labels, get everything in the same format. Uh, often you even want everything like in the same uh, data distribution. So you actually need to go in and uh, clean that all up. Important thing is with that step uh, is if you come up with such kind of cleaning and preparation pipeline here in the beginning, so where you prepare your training data, you actually you need to do the same light later on for model serving. Uh, so when you're serving your model and you're hitting it with live data and this live data hasn't been cleansed or prepared in the same way, obviously it's going to have really bad performance. So you should actually come up with uh, data cleaning and preparation pipeline, uh, you can employ both here and also here at the serving part. And again, this is something where MLflow can be really useful uh, to uh, help us structure that in a nice way. And uh, yeah, this is then uh, if I actually, am, if I'm building like more complex features, so the example I had earlier is like at Airbnb for example, Different people need uh, access. For example, I'm building a fraud model uh, to detect like who is trying to game the system here at Airbnb. And for that, I need some representation of the user, obviously. And so the first data scientist, he comes up with a representation of the user. He cleans that data set. He selects certain characteristics, maybe transforms them even. And uh, then once he has done that, he can actually share that user feature and someone else, the next person who is maybe building another fraud model, he can simply go in, pick up that model from the feature catalog, and then use that. A really good blog post about that is by Uber, and their system is called Michelangelo. So whoever wants to learn more about like this feature store or feature catalog idea, I would highly recommend this blog post here. Uh, next thing, and uh, this is the model libraries or the reusing of uh, pre-trained models. So a lot of those models are actually being shared. So for example, Google is putting a lot of their models here in those tfhub.dev uh, Google. So if I need certain things, so for example, I want to do image recognition, typically I shouldn't, first of all, I shouldn't go in and simply develop my own architecture, my own model. They're really smart people. I've spent a lot of time doing that. Secondly, also often I don't even need to train that model myself from scratch. So I can take a pre-trained model and then I can actually just add like a small data set, uh, strive off the last few layers of that neural network and then retrain that with my own data set and hence kind of like specializing the general uh, vision model, the uh, general image recognition model to exactly the images uh, I want to classify. Uh, next is about actually writing code. So in most systems there's actually, have a lot of different APIs available and uh, for those people who've started with TensorFlow a while back, those first TensorFlow APIs were really, really low level and annoying. And just having seen how the TensorFlow ecosystem developed over time, a lot of people actually developed higher level APIs simply because there was this lack of. As of right now, they're actually standardized on like two different uh, systems. So first of all, if you write something yourself, it's probably, it's going to be estimators. And the other thing, uh, what the TensorFlow community is pushing is uh, the carers interface. Uh, so that's also now in the code base itself. So typically, if you nowadays start up with TensorFlow, the first APIs you're going to use are, are going to be Keras APIs. <laughs> Debugging. Um, so how many of you know uh, the difference between a static compute graph and the eager execution in TensorFlow? Oh, two hands. All right. So TensorFlow by itself what TensorFlow um, in the current version is doing by default, it's building, it's taking like all my entire specification and it's building a graph. So a graph kind of consists of different nodes and that's like what computations do I want to do. And TensorFlow is actually first building the entire graph and then it's uh, running that with data. 
Other systems, such as PyTorch, for example, they build a dynamic computation graph. So they take, they build the first node, they run the data through there, and then take the next, and so on and so on. And this model of actually building a dynamic graph makes debugging a whole lot easier, because if I only have the entire graph, it's really hard to figure out what's happening between those different nodes. Um, TensorFlow introduced a, a motors called eager execution, which pretty much is the same as this uh, dynamic computation graph, which makes interpreting and also debugging uh, those models a whole lot easier. So just in general, debugging those models is, can be quite difficult. And this is, for example, where also TensorBoard now uh, includes the TF debug interface. In the early days, it just used to be like a CLI extension, which was really awful to use. But by now, if I want to debug TensorFlow, it's actually part of uh, TensorBoard, so the default monitoring solution here. Similar with profiling. Profiling is probably one of the most critical things, especially if I'm using more expensive uh, resources such as GPUs or even TPUs on Google Cloud. So I really need to make sure I'm actually utilizing them because uh, most often I'm actually going to waste a lot of resources in terms of like memory transfer or other things. Um, and actually like if I get into profiling, there are like a lot of secret variables like uh, the power of like 16 is really good for NVIDIA uh, GPUs and if I structure all my uh, matrices to be like powers, uh, multiples of 16, it's going to run much faster. And all those things which I first figure out if I really go deep into profiling my uh, models or my training. Uh, next thing is um, the challenge that I'm not typically training only one model. Typically, I'm actually training a bunch of different models. So here's this like, if a data scientist he specifies like one model function, but then we have different hyperparameters. So hyperparameters are, for example, the network shape. So how many layers do I have here in my network? How many nodes do I have per layer? And this is typically nothing which gets specified by a data scientist, but it actually gets optimized by the overall system because it's quite challenging and uh, a human shouldn't actually worry about that. Other hyperparameters are, for example, learning rates, so how quickly should my values update uh, during training. And uh, so uh, this is like also quite like an art and uh, active area of research right now is how can I do a decent hyperparameter optimization over like this large uh, range of parameters I might have. The next thing, and this is uh, probably something if uh, you haven't done that yet, I would highly recommend that, and that is model optimization. Imagine you just trained your model, and uh, that model, it produces the right output, uh, good accuracy, so you're actually quite happy. But now, you should actually go in and optimize it, and optimization means typically like, for example, striping unused nodes, removing nodes which are not used, folding constants, and so on, uh, quantize weights. So the goal here is to actually make it run faster and to be smaller. So typically TensorFlow models, depending on how large your network is, they can like have up to like hundreds of megabytes uh, of representation. And by optimizing them, you can really cut them down uh, to something, uh, for example, be able to run on a smartphone. Uh, I also seen organizations which actually produce multiple optimized version of uh, their models. So they train like one model and then they have like one optimized for CPUs, one optimized for GPUs, maybe one optimized for like small mobile devices. And all those uh, include different optimizations. Uh, another typical optimization is for example the uh, value representation. During training, I typically want like a really precise representation because otherwise errors are going to accumulate over time. But once I'm serving, this is like one pass through the network, so there's not that much space for actually errors to accumulate. And so often I can actually reduce the precision uh, of my uh, weights representation or of my parameter representation in general. And there are actually, Google came up with their own 
floating point representations specifically for serving later on. Uh, the challenge here with monitoring uh, we should look at uh, is actually to understand that we need to monitor two things. First of all, we need to monitor the model and the model accuracy uh, by itself. Secondly, we also need to monitor the entire overall architecture. If we just recall that complex pictures, there are a lot of moving components, there are a lot of distributed systems in there, so I definitely need like a traditional cluster monitoring tool to just make sure that my entire pipeline is up and running. Uh, next thing I should actually consider, because that also often gets forgotten, is the serving environment. So how do I deploy my models? Can I upgrade them? So what is if I have like a newly trained model and I just need to replace the one I've been using before? And uh, the other thing is that actually often it's very useful to run multiple models in parallel. And there's like a cool pattern, it's called like rendezvous pattern. And uh, I have all my requests coming in like in a Kafka pipeline and then all those models they are simply like consumer groups to my Kafka pipeline and they write their output into another Kafka pipeline and then I have this rendezvous component which is kind of picking whatever decision it should make that can be an ensemble decision that can only say like I only take the output of model one I ignore the rest um, so this is kind of like up to this component or the policy of this component. Uh, this is also helpful. Imagine like we just trained model three. We don't really know what the performance is. With this pattern, we can actually just throw it into and expose it to live data without impacting actually any user decisions. But we can easily compare what are the predictions done by model one and two compared to model three. And another very useful pattern here is to actually have some dummy models which simply capture the overall like statistics of the data like mean, variance, and that can be very helpful if something fundamentally changes in my underlying data set. So if the incoming request, if they really change over time, such kind of dummy model just capturing basic statistics can be very useful because if the data statistics change over time, probably my models should also adapt to this new distribution of data. Next challenge, how many of you actually ever ran distributed TensorFlow? How many of you, uh, which versions, like, uh, what setup did you use? Uh, okay, you, you used like the normal TensorFlow distribution, right? Okay, the normal TensorFlow distribution, at least as of 1.0, uh, it's basically structured like that. We have a set of workers and they are doing the actual work. They are doing like matrix multiplication, and all those mathematical operations. But what they actually need to do as it's being distributed, they need to kind of like update each other with their results. And this is why in the traditional tensor, distributed TensorFlow model, we have so-called parameter servers. So those guys, once they are done computing, they actually send their updates there, and then they get the new set of uh, parameters from all the others. So those are kind of like the syncing points in the architecture. And that makes setting up distributed TensorFlow quite annoying and challenging because even though just figuring out this ratio of parameter servers to workers can be quite difficult because it might vary on your actual data, on your actual model you're deploying. This is why Uber came up with something called Horowood. And Horowood is basically getting rid of those parameter servers by employing an uh, algorithm called All Reduce. So all reduce, it basically, it lets all the workers update the parameters between themselves in the provably uh, uh, least network, uh, with the least network uh, bandwidth uh, used. Uh, if you ever used like MPI based systems, that's also primitives there. And so this basically simplifies how I can set up my TensorFlow cluster because I don't have to worry anymore about the division of workers to parameter service. This actually also made its way back into TensorFlow itself. So in the last two releases, they have this new concept of so-called distribution strategies. And one of those distribution strategies is basically uh, this all-reduced model uh, where I don't need parameter service anymore.
uh, one of the last challenges I should consider is how can I actually set up all those different systems? So we already saw we need like something like Spark, HDFS, Jenkins for CI, Jupyter, uh, TensorFlow for training. So in the, in the like naive way, we actually, we take the first four virtual machines, we assign them to Spark, we take the next three virtual machines, and that's my TensorFlow cluster, and so on and so on. Uh, that is just making, uh, setting up and maintaining those clusters quite hard, because the operator actually has to keep track of that, and uh, potentially scale up and scale down. Um, and also I'm wasting a lot of resources as I'm having like multiple VMs for each of those servers. And this is why we really, really need like a cluster and resource orchestration layer as ECUS as we saw in the earlier talk, which is basically taking all those resources and uh, throwing them together in like one big mix. And I think this is bringing me up to uh, just a short demo to actually have everyone also go home at some point. But this is pretty much the idea of uh, DCUS or Mesos, is to take a bunch of resources and then have multiple systems running on top. So here in my cluster, I actually have uh, Kubernetes running here, I have two Kafka clusters, I have Jupyter, I have HDFS running here, and this is actually running all on the same infrastructure. So if I uh, look at notes, there it is. So if I look at notes here, I can actually see uh, that it's being spread out and I can even see there's like Kubernetes running on this node and red I think it's HDFS so they're actually all running on the same node here. All right and the other thing uh, we have in DCUS is a service catalog so we work together with partners and actually delivering uh, what the first talk was about. I, I like to call it like service orchestration so pretty much what Kubernetes is doing for containers, make sure containers are up and running, it's actually doing the same for distributed systems. Just if I'm doing that for distributed systems, it's a different problem scale. If one of my stateless container fails, I restart that. I don't even care where in my infrastructure it's being restarted. But what happens if in my HDFS clusters my both name nodes are failing? Uh, anyone ever experience that? Yes, nodding. So what do you do? You go in, you recover the state from the journal node, uh, you go in next and uh, then you, for, uh, you bootstrap the first name nodes and the second name node. So there's actually like a lot more manual work and a lot more dependencies involved because I'm dealing with stateful distributed systems. I have to restart. And this is actually what's all encoded in those schedulers and they basically take care of that from me. And this is simply why service orchestration is harder than simply container orchestration. So we basically have uh, Jupyter in here. So it's similar as we saw earlier. I simply go in here, I can configure things. Uh, what I probably need is actually uh, my host name, which I've stored here. So I need to tell it where to expose my service to. That looks good, and I should give it a different name. Well, let's simply put it in a different folder. And the other cool thing we can do is let's actually enable uh, GPU support. So we want that our Jupyter notebook is running with one GPU. As I don't want to wait for the Jupyter to deploy, I actually deployed one up front. So this is kind of the lock-in screen. This is the other nice thing we actually did. What I really hate about Jupyter is the lock-in model. So we actually put an Nginx up front which can do proper authentication and not this simply like password authentication here. All right, and here we now have uh, the first view if I come into my uh, Jupyter uh, lab notebook actually. Um, and let's actually deploy like the first thing. This is so this is the Tori Scala kernel, and this actually allows me to easily specify uh, Spark jobs. So now I don't want to write that code on the fly, so I'll copy that. 
So if I go in here like data scientist, he doesn't have, now have to worry about setting up uh, any Spark cluster or anything. He is simply running that. And uh, what the system will do in the background, it will now actually spawn uh, an, a Spark cluster and uh, run that code. I mean, in this example, it's actually quite easy because we're just computing pi, uh, but it's an easily uh, distributable problem. Uh, so uh, we can already see that. The nice thing is, and this is all hidden from the data scientist view, but if we actually look at, at like the Mesos level down here, we actually see here, uh, we are now spinning up our five node Tori cluster here. So we're spinning up a five node Spark cluster. And as mentioned, data scientists coming from like a mathematical background, they don't want to have to worry about any of that. They simply want that this job is uh, running on like a large cluster and now it computed that thing. And actually if I, I simply run that again now, as we already established the context, uh, it's also going to be uh, much faster because we already set up the cluster here. And uh, I believe this is kind of the way for a data scientist to hide the entire complexity of this uh, overall system we saw. Uh, another example is for example here, I simply have the core side and HDFS side in here. And this is pointing to my cluster uh, running here. So here, this is basically this HDFS cluster here. So also as a data scientist, I don't have to worry about uh, getting access to my data set. This is Kerberized HDFS, uh, and I can simply access and store my data sets on there. Thank you so much.